بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم أمين وبعد I want to comment on, on a mess'ala from yesterday that pertains to a mess'ala from previous. It's the issue of praying the fard a second time with congregation. It's called mu'ada in, in Arabic. You're repeating a fard salah that you already prayed. And we said the scenario is you prayed the fard, you come to the masjid, and the jama'ah of the masjid have not prayed yet. So what should you do? We said that you pray with the jama'ah. That is the sunnah. The sunnah is to pray with the congregation and to not sit out. There's a hadith narrated of two men who came to the masjid during the time of Rasulullah wasallam, and they had prayed fajr in their home. So they didn't pray with the jama'ah. And so the Prophet ﷺ corrected them and he told them to pray. Even if you prayed at home and you come to the masjid and Jama'ah hasn't prayed, you pray with them. Um, and so the mas'ala came up, what do you intend? And so we said you intend the fard. You intend the fard of that prayer. So if you prayed Fajr at home, then you came to the masjid and the Jama'ah didn't pray yet, you intend to pray the fard of Fajr. For you, you will be receiving the reward of Sunnah. Because the brother asks, what will the reward be? It will be the reward of a sunnah, but the intention is going to be the intention of fard. Because the person you're following is praying fard, and you're praying with them for the sake of praying in jama'ah. Does that make sense? So the intention is the intention of fard, because of what the jama'ah is praying, and what they're intending. But the reward of it for you is the reward of sunnah because you have already fulfilled the fard. Does that, is that clear? Right, so, and then the question is, one of the elders asked, if a third jama'ah, if a second jama'ah comes, do you keep doing that? And so we said that, I, I read on this mas'ala, the official opinion of the school of the Shafi'i school is that you only do it for one jama'ah. So if you prayed at home Fajr, and you came to the Masjid and they prayed Fajr, you pray with them. If another Jama'ah prays after, there's another group of brothers, they came late, and now you want, do you pray with them as well? The official opinion of the school is what? You don't pray with them. It's just for the first Salah. Just the, for the first Salah, that's Jama'ah. After the first, you don't repeat it over again and again. Some scholars said within the Shafi'i school, you keep repeating, it's okay. Some of them said you keep repeating. But the official opinion is that what? You only repeat the, fir the first fard and not endlessly. Is that, is that clear? No, inshallah. So that is the, just a mas'ala I think that, that was discussed yesterday and, and, and um, I did some research on. There's the issue of the khatib's movement in the khutbah, which I didn't get to. Um, inshallah, I will try to uh, do some, uh, uh, you know, a search on that. And inshallah, we'll, I'll try to address that inshallah ta'ala. Um, in, in the following, in the coming durus, inshallah. So tonight we're on page 97. The author, rahmatullah alayhi, says, Alamwalu lati talzamu fiha zakah sitta tu anwa. The wealth upon which zakah is compulsory are six types. So the, the wealth that we have to pay zakah um, on behalf of. There are six types of wealth. And so we will talk about this and how it translates to modern um, assets, right? Cash, gold, uh, uh, land, trade, livestock, agriculture, right? How do these things translate? So inshallah, we'll speak on this. We're not going to speak too much on it. I advise people who have complex zakah questions to ask in private so that we can research it and address it, inshallah ta'ala. Right now, this is just going to be more of a general, informative lesson. We're not trying to give fat fatwa for a specific amwal or, you know, cases, but just to kind of get a general understanding of how zakah works. 
Um, before we continue, zakah is wajib upon every Muslim, male or female, young or old, child, adolescent, adult, doesn't matter. If a child, let's say, inherits a large sum of wealth from a parent that passed, their parent died, this child's parent was wealthy, they left them a large sum of wealth, it's in their trust fund. That wealth, zakah has to be paid on it. Does that make sense? So zakah has to be paid on the wealth, regardless of the individual. As long as they're Muslim, zakah has to be paid on their wealth. Is the hukum clear? Inshallah. Um, so he says there are six types of zakah, uh, of wealth that zakah has to be paid on. Number one is livestock. This is what we call uh, an am or, or na'am. So if a person has, a, um, has, has you know, cattle, goats, sheep. Today in the U.S., I, I, I haven't met a, a Muslim. Actually, I do, know a couple, I do know a farmer who has some. But it's not large enough where he has to pay zakah. You only pay zakah on livestock if you have a large number of them. So he had, he had about 10 or 15, not too much. We're gonna get to that stuff, but this is <laughs> do you, right. This is zakah. This is this is. I'm oh, sorry, livestock. This is if you have a farm. Nobody here has a farm. Anybody have a farm? Anybody have livestock that I don't know about? You have livestock. Uh, no, I have a farm. You have a farm. Yeah. Do you have cattle? No. Any sheep? Anything? No. Nothing. Okay. Do you ha do you uh, have agriculture? Do you? Agriculture. You have agriculture. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we have one brother, mashallah, He has a farm. So we're going to, inshallah, talk a little bit, not too much. This book, it's Safinatul Najah, he doesn't get into the Masail of Zakah. So we're just going to touch upon it life, so softly. The Ahkam of Na'am is you pay Zakah according to the number. Every 40, you pay this. After every this amount, you pay that. So it, there's, there's a whole system in the bigger books of fiqh. Even if we just move like the Abu Shuja'a, some of the, you know, just one level up, they talk about how do you calculate that. We're not going to get into that. Just in general, if you ever have a livestock, if you ever have livestock, you have sheep, goats, camel, you have to pay zakah. So make sure you go ask the sheikh and say, yeah, sheikh, how do I pay zakah for on my livestock? Is that clear? First category. Number two is, is money. So money traditionally was gold and silver. Cash before or money had an intrinsic value. Right, gold and silver. We know that um, the U.S. dollar, I think before, up to the 60s, around there, um, the, it was uh, 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 it was you know um, backed by gold, right? And then the U.S. They, they, the U.S. economists they had their own thing, and if you learn economy, they talk about it and why. But the the U.S. dollar wasn't backed by gold anymore, and so that you know changed the, the economic, the whole world pretty much was influenced by that. Um, but regardless of, you know, gold or not, majority of our scholars predominantly say all forms of modern cash also take the same hukum of money, of gold. The term they use in Arabic is naqdan. Naqdan is gold and silver. So technically cash, dollar bills, paper bills today, don't fall under that category. But the scholar said, why do they fall under that category? Because paper money has taken the place of gold. Does that make sense? So that's where cash. So any type of cash um, has that, that, that value. Um, and you give it the same ruling of, of gold and silver. And so whatever ahkam of gold and silver, you give it that same ahkam, that same ruling, inshallah ta'ala. Um, let's see what he says. Okay. I'll comment on this a little bit more. The, and if you guys look on the footnotes, if we want, we can look at the footnotes. He says on, on footnote number three, zakah is wajib for anyone who has possess, possessed the zakah payable amount of gold or silver or one lunar year. Alright? And then he says, Nisab, 
the minimum that necessitates the kah for gold is 20 mithqal, which is equivalent to 84.8 grams, on which 2.5% is due, and for silver is 200 dirhams, which is 594 grams, on which 2.5% is due. And then he said, while there is a considerable difference between the value of the gold and silver as a kah minimum, the minimum for monetary currency should should correspond with that of silver, since it is more beneficial for the poor. So just to comment on this briefly, for zakat to be wajib on gold, silver, cash, you have to have two requirements, two essential requirements. The requirement number one, we call it nisab. Nisab means that your money has to reach a minimum balance for zakah to start. There has to be a minimum balance for zakah to start. We call that nisab. What is that minimum balance? 84.8 grams of gold. Does that make sense? 84.8 grams of gold. Somebody will say, yeah, Sheikh, how do we convert that to cash? How do we convert 84.8 grams of gold to cash? You check the market value for gram of gold. It's roughly, I think, 59 point something dollars. The last time I checked was like a week ago, I think. I was helping a family, family calculate their zakat. And when we checked, there was about 59 point something. So if we do the math, let's say, if just, let's round it up to 60 to be safe. So how much, what is the nisab of gold? 84.8, right? We said the nisab in gold is what? 84.8. That's gram? Gram. 84.8 gram of gold. If you have that minimum balance of gold, you have to pay zakah. Or it's equivalent in cash. Does that make sense? So 84.8 grams of gold cost, how much money does it cost? 84.8 grams of gold cost, let's say $60. So 84.8 grams of gold is worth $5,088, roughly. Make sense? Make sense? 5,000. 84.8. So 84.8 grams of gold is worth $5,000, $5,088, roughly. So every year difference? A small difference, not too much. Because gold, uh, gold uh, goes up and down. Generally, it goes up. It dips, but it will go. It will eventually go up. Go up. Gold is a very reliable investment, right? It will go. It might dip, but it always goes up. It's eventually going to keep going up, keep going up, right? Because it's it's one of the most secure um, uh, assets and investments in the world is gold. Um, and so, but regardless of that, how do we calculate nisab? Remember this term. Nisab is the minimum balance you need for zakat to be wajib. The minimum nisab is what? 84.8 grams of gold. We want to convert it to cash. In cash, it's about 5,000. So for zakat to become wajib, you have to have $5,000. If a person doesn't have more than 5,000 cash or gold, you don't worry about zakat. Zakat doesn't apply to you. Does that make sense? Less, I'm sorry. If you have less, if you don't have 5000 or more, zakat doesn't apply to you. If you have $5,000 sitting in your bank account, or you have 5000 you know, maybe you have 2000 here, you have 2000 cash, you have another 3000 somewhere else. Total, if you have to have a total of 5000 If your cash, all your cash and gold is worth 5000 or in silver, you have to pay zakat. We're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. But do you guys understand the nisab? We call that nisab. Nisab is the minimum balance required for zakat to be wajib. And for this, you take all your cash you have. Whatever is in your saving, your checking, your cash that you have under your bed, the cash you have in your closet, the, the little bit of gold you have that, you know, whatever you invested in, Maybe you have some silver quarters that you put investment in. All of that, if it's worth 5000 you have to pay zakah. Your wife's money is different. 
If your wife has 5,000 as well, she has to check. She has jewelry, that's 5,000. And then she has her saving, has another couple thousand. She has some cash for emergency, that's another couple thousand. If you have 5,000, she has to also pay zakah. Make sense? That's what we call that nisab. Nisab is the minimum balance. If you're going check to check, you live check to check, you don't have no savings, you have no, you right, you just live check to check. Right? Uh, a large percentage, if not uh, the majority of the, of, of, the, of the population, they live check to check or don't even have enough to live and maintain themselves. Right? There's people that have no zakah. There's no zakah for them. They live in check to check. There's no, they don't have 5,000 at one time. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, zakah only applies on people who have, who are wealthy enough to be like, hey, I can pay all my bills and I can still have some money to the side. Put some money to the side. See? These people, they live comfortable. They're considered, you know, wealthy. If you don't have that, you're not wealthy. Right? So, alhamdulillah, you know, many of us, we live in that comfort where we are able to pay all our bills, cover all of our expenses, and we still have some extra money we put to the side. So that, if, you have, if your money reaches 5,000, start counting your zakah. There's one other requirement you have to check. Sharia doesn't say just you, you have 5,000. Sharia says, you, the zakah is only wajib if you possess that, that nisab, that minimum balance, for one year, continuously, without interruption. So if you have that 5,000, one year, it's just sitting, you don't need it. You know, sometimes you get extra money, you get tax return, and then you have maybe, you know, extra money for a couple of months, and then a few months pass, and you're broke, and you're back to zero again. You don't pay zakah. Because you don't have it for one year. You see? It doesn't apply. So for zakah to apply, you have to have nisab, and you have to have nisab for one year. We call that hulul. So nisab is the minimum balance, and the hulul is the time. You have that minimum balance for one year. It doesn't drop. Your money doesn't go up and down. Your saving just keeps going up. It doesn't drop below 5,000. Does that make sense? So if you have nisab and hulul, you have to pay zakah. Every time, every year, at the end of the year, you have to pay zakah. Does that make sense? Every year, at the end of the year, you pay zakah. So every dime you reach, for example, we do by the Islamic calendar. So let's say Ramadan, this year you have, you have 5,000 in your account. Ramadan next year you have 10,000. You pay zakah on 10,000. Ramadan the year after you have 15,000. You pay zakah for 15,000. Ramadan, so every year you remember, Ramadan I pay my zakah. And then you remember, I check. Okay, let me see. How much is in my checking account? How much is in my savings account? How much do I have this? How much do I have stocks? You calculate your Bitcoin. You calculate everything. You see all of my, you know, cash values. You see total is this. Okay, zakah. Every time the year is over, you count. So you have to have a, ta a time that you memorize. You know, you mark on your calendar. Islamic calendar. Every year you have on your Islamic calendar, Sha'ban. You have, that's why it's important to know the Islamic months. So you have to know the Islamic months. You have in the Islamic calendar every year this month, I have zakah. So when that comes, your alarm goes off. You're like, oh, zakah time. Pay. If you don't pay on time, it's a major sin. If you delay the zakah, because the, the zakah money is not your property. The zakah money is the property of the fuqara that Allah makes wajib for you to give. And he put that money through your hand. So it's not your money. Don't think this is, oh, my bank account looks so good. This is my property. No. The, 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 the zakat money is not your property. It's the property of the fuqara that Allah has made wajib on you. So when the year comes, you have to check. The year is up. Yes, my year is up. I know I, had, I reached 5,000 Ramadan last year. I had 5,000. This Ramadan, I have 10,000. Okay, right away, pay my zakat. Here's my check. Bismillah. Is that, is that clear? So that's how, you, that's how you pay. The third one I'm going to add is, how much do you pay? How much do you pay zakah? You pay 2.5%. 2.5%. They call it in Arabic, ربع العشر. 
which is a quarter of a tenth in percentage, 2.5%. What does that mean? Every thousand, every one thousand dollar, you pay 25, 25 dollars. Every one thousand, calculate, okay, how much cash and gold and everything value together, you pay 25 dollars. And that's your second. So just see how much I have, okay, this year Ramadan, I have 20,000, I have another 10,000 in gold, okay, 30,000. Every 1,000 is, 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 um, is, is $25. So you calculate and then you're able to do it. Another, I mean, if you're able to use a calculator, the way you calculate, you say the amount you have times 0 0.025. If you want to use a calculator, easy. Take the amount, the total, check the value, check your stocks, check your Bitcoin, Check whatever you have, your cash, euro, whatever you have. All of it you check, your gold, your silver, everything. You calculate the value. Say all of this is worth $30,000. Then you take 30,000 times 0 0.025. 30,000 0.025. How much is 30,000 times 0 0.025? 750. So you pay 750. For that, for thirty thousand, for example, does that does that make sense? How you calculate it? One year minimum balance, you pay two point five percent. Yes, Haji. Who, who can eat that money? Yes, we're going to talk about who can receive that money. Yeah. Inshallah, that's going to be the last section of the chapter. I just and we and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I just want to make sure everybody understands. Yeah. We understand how we calculate the zakah, yes. the number, the time, the minimum, brother. Okay. But sometimes, you know, like Ramadan this year is March, sometimes June, July. Yeah, maybe. don't, don't. You count Ramadan. That's why we follow the Islamic calendar. Don't worry about the, the, the Gregorian, you know, or Western calendar. Yeah. For Zakah, Islamic calendar. Every year you pay Ramadan, Ramadan. If you pay Sha'ban, Sha'ban. You pay Muharram, Muharram. So whatever month you pay, always look at the Islamic calendar. Do not look at the Gregorian calendar. For zakah, we calculate according to Islamic calendar. And whatever month you pay your zakah, you stick to that month. You stick to that month. Does that make sense? Don't change it with the, the, the December, January, none of that. Don't worry about all that. That doesn't matter. What you have, yeah. yes, at the Ramadan. Yeah, Ramadan. So you pay your zakah. So Ramadan, you check. You go to your balance. You see how much is in my saving, how much is in my checking, how much gold, how much Bitcoin, how much everything. Calculate, pay. You check what you have at the time the year ended. Do you understand? It, it doesn't matter. As long as you had 5,000, it doesn't matter what you started with. You can start with 5,000 and then by Ramadan you have 1 million. You pay the cow for one million. Does that make sense? You can start with one million, and then Ramadan you have five thousand. You pay the cow for five thousand. Does that make sense? So the zakah is paid on what is in your possession after the year is complete. Is that does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. You know, like some people say, like you can pay first um, the month first. You know, you don't get the Ramadan and the Ramadan. No, you don't pay zakah for one thousand. No way, you know, I'm no, no. It has to be five thousand or more. All right, except for I got forty thousand, I got one thousand for zakah. You know, July I paid it two hundred. Um, December, you know, I need to pay three hundred. So I was, and I pay five hundred already. And to Ramadan, I uh, I got five hundred more to pay. Yes. So that? the brother asked. The question is, if I read it. Can I pay my zakah early throughout yeah. the year? Yeah, exactly. You're not paying late. Yeah. You can pay late, yeah. but can you pay early? So your zakah is due Ramadan, but before Ramadan, your uncle hit you up. He's like, my nephew sent me, I, I'm going through some hardship, help me out. You send him some money, you make niyyah, 
You have to make the niya intention. You say, okay, this is a, this is a cat. Here you go. And then somebody else call you. They're like, brother, you know, I'm going through some hardship. This is what's going on. There's somebody sick in the t in our community, or there's a family. They're going. They're they're ha they're having some housing problems. You like you like here, and you make intention for what? Zakah. That's okay. You record it. All right? You record that. You can so you can pay your zakah. So the ruling is: Can you pay your zakah early? You can on condition that you make the intention for zakah. On the condition that you make intention for zakah, when Ramadan comes, let's say your zakah that's due is 1,000 zakah is due. But you already pay 500. You give a couple hundred to the community neighbor, a couple hundred to a family member, somebody was sick, somebody had house, whatever. You send it. Ramadan comes, you already pay 700, 500 zakah. You made the niya. You have how much left? You have another 500. You pay that one and you're done. So yes, you can pay the zakah early. And you can give to family members who are, who, who are poor. Who are poor or they have a need. They have a need. You don't have to wait for the year. You can pay early. But after a year, if you haven't paid, you have to pay. Does that make sense? So if you haven't, then at the year you don't delay. You have to pay. But if you pay it a bit early before that, because some circumstances, there was opportunity. Turkey had an earthquake this year. You want to give some of your zakat to, to the, the, the brothers and sisters afflicted there? La bas, you can do that. You can give the zakat early, right? The Pakistan had a flood right before that. Somali had a drought. And you're like, okay, there's you know, the Yemen civil wars. Syria, may Allah ease the affairs of the Muslimin. So many trials and calamities. And you're like, you know, there's a calamity. I want to be there for the people. Here's some zakat money. Bismillah. You give your zakat. It's okay. You can do that. Yeah. Just make sure you record it. Yeah. Because you forget, you, you don't remember how many times you give zakah, how many... Yeah. So just make sure you have some type of receipt or you track it so that, you know, when the zakah time comes, you know how much you've paid and you know how much you have left. Make sense? Brother Andrew? So you, you would only... So zakah only concerns you if you have the money to pay zakah. Exactly. And the minimum balance is 5,000 roughly for a con year continuously. So you have cash assets in your possession that are worth 5,000 roughly for one continuous year. If that balance is dropping and fluctuating, then no. But this has to be 5,000 consistent in, the, in your possession for a year. Make sense? Allah wa'ala. Alright. So that took some time, inshallah. Let's see if we can wrap up this chapter tonight. That's our intention. The next step of zakah, a property that you pay zakah on are crops. You have agriculture. A brother has a farm and he has crops, grain, whatever it might be. You have to pay zakah on that. How do you pray? He says the zakah for crops is only on the staple types that people cultivate, dry and store, such as wheat, barley, Millet, rice. I don't even know what millet is. Um, so, but yeah, wheat, barley, millet, rice. So zakah is only on the types of crop that people eat as a staple food. Like rice is a staple food. It's a food that everybody eats. It's, a, it's part of their regular meal. Does that make sense? Barley and wheat, right, is a staple food. Bread. Right? Cereal. Right? We use this to, to eat our daily meals as a staple food. And that's dry as well. Not vegetables and fruits. That's dry that you store. That you store. You pay zakah on that. You pay zakah on that. Okay? You don't pay zakah on fruits and vegetables. And, and No. He says what? There is no zakah on fruit except for raw dates and grapes. Only fruit you pay zakah is raw dates and grapes. He says there is no zakah on vegetables, nor is there zakah on seasonings, such as cumin or coriander, since the main aim in using them is preparation for food, not nourishment. The minimal quantity on which zakah is payable for crops is 618.8 kilograms of net dried weight, free of husks or chef. So if you have 600... 
grams, kilograms of that staple food, then you pay zakah on it. So you today you weigh it, right? You weigh it. And he said the, the, the zakah for crops that have been watered without effort as by rain and the like is 10% of the crop. So if there's, if there's this crop, it grows by natural rain and you don't rain, you don't, you know, pour, pour rain water on it, you don't water it, you don't, you know, plow. It just kind of grows on its own. You plant the seeds and, and khalas, it grows. That is the kah that, that is uh, not even plowing. That's to do with rain. If it's naturally watered, you pay 10%. Not 2.5, you pay what? 10%. Every time you harvest, not after a year, every time you harvest, you pay 10%. And then he says, the zakah for crops that have been watered with effort, such as on land irrigated by ditches, is 5% of the crop. So if you water it, you make effort, you spend time and, and, and money to water it, you only pay 5% of that uh, crops, in, uh, of zakah uh, on behalf of those crops. Does that make sense? Alhamdulillah, I don't, you know, uh, uh, the brother has the farmer. I'll tell you, you I mean, you're not a farmer, but you do have a farm. Um, so I would say consult, say consult, you know, if you have any of those requirements, consult, inshallah, you can ask me afterwards or consult a scholar, inshallah, and so that you can receive the proper uh, uh, fatwa regarding that, inshallah. Uh, number four, wealth acquired from business in which two and a half percent of the value of the commodity should be char discharged. So this is what we call urub at tijara, right? So al tijara. So if you have a shop, you sell products. You're a merchant, right? You have a shop. You have a halal store. You have a grocery store. You you sell clothes whatever it might be, any product that you're selling. We call these, you know, products or, or uruda tijara. Um, you pay 2.5% of that value of the total inventory after one year. So you take an inventory after a year. You look at your store, you say, what is the total value of all my inventory? You check, okay, the total value of my inventory is this amount. Then you have to pay 2.5% of the value of your inventory. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anybody have a store here? Anybody have a business? So, nobody. Yeah, uh, the check by check, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, so Haji asked about two things. One, he asked earlier about uh, 401k and retirement. Um, if you have access, which you know I, I believe that you typically do, um, there are some stipulations on how you can access your 401k. You pay zakah. But if you don't have the access, you don't. Um, I have to check. I don't recall. I remember reading some fatawa about 401k. And, and how to, well, you know, when do you determine the zakah is due? Access is the big thing. If you have access, then you pay. If you don't have access to that money, or like let's say a kid, he has inheritance, but he has no access to it. It's not, he can't touch it, or he can't access it until he reaches 18. That's in the requirement will or yeah. something. Then there's no zakah on him, because he doesn't have access to that will. Right? It's not in his possession yet. Um, and so, but if there is access and somebody is managing the money, then you have to pay zakah. Does that make sense? So for the 401k, I'll check, inshallah. I'll get back to you on that. I'll try to see a comment on that tomorrow. I've read it. I know there's some, there's some, um, there's nuance. Like there's details we have to pay attention to before we give a fatwa on it. And so I'll check that, inshallah ta'ala. Um, on your personal property, your home that you bought, your car, um, even a woman's personal jewelry that she wears. She wears it at least once a year. She doesn't have to pay zakah, according to the majority of the ulama. Among them is the Shafi'i school. Women's personal jewelry 
her earrings that she wears, necklace that she wears, even if she only wears it for occasions, as long as she wears it once a year, there's no zakah required. It is safer to pay, but it's not required. Two point five percent, same thing. At least once, if you wear, it, if she wears it once a year, amount the value. Five thousand, five thousand dollar, forty eight point eighty four point eight. Anything above that, you pay. You pay. Okay, you don't pay that. If it's less, if it's just a gold ring, you don't pay. But if it's eighty four point eight grams of gold or higher. Right, and this is in combination with cash. So maybe her gold is worth two thousand, but then she has cash worth three thousand. You have to put it together. Does that make sense? So we any personal property, there's no zakah. No zakah on personal property. Your car, you can have the most expensive car, you can have a mansion, you can have acres of land, you can have, you know, women can have all types of jewelry, and she wears it throughout, you know, weddings, weddings special occasions, gatherings, friends, families come over. Those are personal items. Personal assets that you use, you don't pay zakah on, even if they're extremely expensive. Even if they're very expensive and very price, uh, cost a lot, there's no zakah on personal items. If I want to. Of course. Yeah. You, it's sadaqah. Yeah, if you want to, it's sadaqah for you. And it's safe, it's, it's good. Right? So sadaqah is, is always good, but we're just talking about wajib. Right? We're just talking about wajib. But it's, it's sadaqah is always good. Because, you know, the, problem, the hadith says, well, sadaqah to burhan. Sadaqah is evidence of your iman. When you believe, when you have true iman, you believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's going to reward you, and He's going to accept from you, and that you're given this for him and for the service of the Muslimin. Yeah. Khalas, it's easy. And you know the dunya is temporary. Right? Your heart is not attached to the dunya. Your heart is attached to Allah. The money doesn't stress you. If you're stressed by the money, that means your heart still is stressed, it's attached to money. If you panic, if you don't have enough money, you panic. That means your heart is still attached to money. Right? That's, this is a symptom. That's what the Prophet ﷺ, he gave the giving of a man who doesn't fear poverty. Because yeah. all his heart is attached to Allah. All his hope is in Allah. Right? The iman of Rasulullah ﷺ was like that. That's where we were da'if. We're da May Allah guide us. Right? We still, you know, we have some iman inshallah, but, right? But they had that type of iman to be like, oh, right? I, don't, I don't fear poverty. I spend and I'm not scared. It's hard. Sayyidina Abu Bakr anhu was like that too. Right? He gave all his wealth for Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sayyidina Umar anhu, he couldn't, that's a high maqam, right? He gave half. Right? People today, they, they you know, we struggle. Maybe 1%, 2%. If we're doing good, if we're doing good, we give 2%. Right? Sadaqa every month. So that's something to work on. Too. We want to give abundant sadaqa. But Allah is Rahim, He made the zakah easy. You see, the sadaqah, you have to do mujahada, you have to do jihad to, to, to fight your nafs, to overcome the fear of poverty and the fear of losing money. So that one you work on. Allah didn't make it wajib on you. But the zakah, Allah made the zakah that's wajib, he, make it, he made it easy. He made it easy. Anybody who, only the rich people, and they only give 2.5%, so it's not too much. So you don't, you don't stress. And even with that, people, they don't pay their zakah. They're like, ah, oh, three, this is 3,000, 4,000 for zakah, how can I? No, no, it's okay. They go for years, they don't pay their zakah. Right? And so that's, that one is a sin. Because you can't prevent the zakah. Every year you have to pay it on time. Wallahu alam. Any, any questions? Yeah. Um, I, I'm taking my time with this chapter because I want everybody to just to understand it because zakah is usually, masail of money, they're complicated. It takes a little bit of focus. And, 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 and attention to detail to understand. So we're going a little slow so that inshallah everybody can understand it and process it inshallah ta'ala. Uh, yeah, yeah, brother. Investment. You invest in, uh, in real estate, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
And the way you invest in real estate are different, inshallah. I don't want to address it now, but if somebody has those masail, we can talk about it another time, inshallah. You can bring it up. If you have real estate, there's a few possibilities. You could be investing in real estate to rent. Right? You're buying properties and you're renting them out. And that's it's just an investment. Um, or you could be what they call is... Um, you could be... Um, what do you call it? Um, uh, you know, uh, selling, buying and selling property. Flipping houses is what they call it, right? You buy an old house, you repair, you sell, and you flip houses, and, and you sell, you buy and sell property. You're a property land uh, developer, things like that. That one has its own ahkam as well. So I'm not going to get into it, but if you have that, if you have some property that you own and you're renting here or internationally abroad, inshallah, we can speak about that at a later time. And if any of the audience, are, you know, listening online, has some questions, I would, uh, inshallah, we can ask later. There's a brother whose his name is Joe Bradford. He's based in, I think, um, around the Dallas area, Dallas, Texas area. Um, if I'm not, if I think that's where he's at, or he's in Southern California. I'm not sure, but he's somewhere, either between Texas or California, I forgot. He has, he's, he's, a, he's like a special, um, his specialty is, is zakah and, and business. So and, and so he's he's really good. He he offers a service to con, to and uh, to uh, as a consultant. So if you wanna, if somebody has a specific uh, questions about zakah, they have assets, all this very, and they wanna get an accurate, detailed answer, I refer them to Joe Bradford. You can search him up, Joe Bradford, Sheikh Joe Bradford. He's very well knowledgeable, very well educated, and highly trained in the ahkam. <coughs> of uh, tijara, of business, as well as the ahkam of zakah. So I would say, inshallah, refer to him. He talks about 401k, uh, a lot of different masail, you know, uh, inshallah. So I would say refer to him. Uh, and if you want to ask me in private, I can, inshallah, you know, assist, uh, inshallah ta'ala. The number five is treasure tro troves. And these, these masail aren't too common today. Um, he says here in the footnote, um, an immediate zakah of 20% is due when one finds a treasure trove that was buried in pre-Islamic time or by non-Muslims, ancient or modern. So if you find zakah, you discovered some type of treasure, then you pay 20% if you, describe, if you discover some type of treasure. If such a treasure is found on owned land, it belongs to the owner of the land. If found in a masjid or street, or if it was buried in Islamic times, it is considered as a lost and found article. And that has its own rulings. We call that ahkam al luqata What is the ruling of a lost and found item? If you find something, right, you, you have it, somebody lost a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, somebody lost, you know, maybe a jewelry, you found it, you hold on to it. What is the ahkam? So that's called ahkam al luqata there's a section about that. The author doesn't address that here. But there's also a kitab or a chapter in fiqh that talks about the ruling of lost and found items. And so we spoke about treasure troves. Number six are mines. And so he says in the footnote, a zakah of 2.5% is immediately due on the zakah minimum or more of gold or silver. Excluding anything else such as iron, lead, crystal, emerald, or other on which there is no zakah. Extracted from a mine located on land permissible for the miner to work on or own by him. And that this amount of ore has been gathered by working at the site one time or several times uninter uninterrupted by abandoning or neglecting, neglecting the project. The zakah is only paid after the, that ore is refined into metal. And so this is talking if somebody mines gold and silver, you pay zakah. Here, the author, the commentator, he excludes any other uh, raw material such as iron, lead, crystal, emerald, and so on. So there's no zakah on that. Just on raw gold and silver. Uh, you pay 20, uh, you pay 2.5% uh, once it reaches the nisab after it has been refined into metal. Does that make sense? Inshallah, again, we... None of us are digging and mining gold and silver, so, right? So we don't have to, you know, we had the gold rush in the U.S. And that time, people who were mining gold, you know, in some parts of the world, people are mining. 
they have the ahkam. Inshallah, I don't think anybody here is minding anything. So we're okay, inshallah ta'ala. We got to worry that the care of our savings and, 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 and our investments and stocks and Bitcoin and all the other stuff, crypto, cryptocurrency and all that. Um, yes, brother. Did you mention about the gold and silver only? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a bigger issue. Do you pay zakah on other jewelry that's not gold or silver? Um, from what I know, the position of the school is that no, you don't pay it on, on, on other jewelry. It's specific to gold and silver. Yeah, Allah alam. But inshallah, I can, I can research that. So we have, we have two masail. I have the masail of gold and silver. We have the masail of the khatib and khatib's movement. And I think there was one other masail. I, I, I didn't bring a pen. Um, I think there's another masala, if I remember and recall, the 401k. The 401k, inshallah. I'll check those three masala and I'll try to comment on it. Uh, renting, house. renting house. 401k and renting house. Uh, Jum'ah and the movement. And um, other jewelry besides gold and silver, inshallah. Ta'ala. We'll check on that, bismillah. And I'll try to comment on that the following nights, inshallah. Here the author, rahimahullah, he speaks about the zakah of Eid al-Fitr. And this is coming up, so inshallah it's relevant. He said, the zakah of Eid al-Fitr is wajib for every free Muslim, male, female, or child, provided that one has the necessary amount of food or in money, um, or in money value thereof for the day of Eid for himself and those whom one is oblig oblig obliged to support. What well, one needs to clothe them and in excess of one's debts and housing expenses. So the conclusion of this paragraph is that you have to pay zakat al-Fitr on behalf of every Muslim. Every Muslim has to pay it. And the head of the household is responsible for himself, his wife, and children. Um, once they're adolescents, they're responsible for themselves. Technically, in Sharia, they're adults, so they're supposed to pay for themselves. Um, but the father can let them know that he's paying the zakah, and he can pay as well. That's not a problem. But Sharia-wise, the wajib is on them. If the father says, I'm not going to pay for you, you go take care of it yourself, they take care of it themselves. If they're poor, they don't have anything, they don't have to pay the cattle fitter. That's the technical rule. Um, but again, the father can pay for them, and then he just informs them. And he should inform them just to let them know that he's paying their zakah. So they also have that awareness that they have to pay so that they know it's wajib on them and that their dad is paying it on behalf of them. Once they're the age, the age of you know, adolescence or puberty, they reach puberty, they should be informed. Some, I know a lot of parents still pay on behalf of their kids, even when their kids have married. You have to tell them, I'm going to pay your zakah, because it's wajib on him. So you have to tell them, I'm going to pay your zakah. He says, okay, then you pay. But you don't just assume and pay. You don't just assume and pay. You have to make sure you get their consent. Does that, does that make sense? Um, and so you pay on behalf of every person, even if it's a newborn child. Somebody had a newborn baby in Ramadan, they pay zakah. Everybody in the house. Any living Muslim soul, you pay zakah on their behalf. Alhamdulillah, zakat al-fitr is not much. It's easy. 15, but huh? it's estimated to be 10 to $15. So alhamdulillah, that's very easy. But um, some people might not be able to afford it. But those, of course, who are, they have to pay. And then he says, the zakah of Eid al-fitr becomes wajib when the sun sets on the night before Eid. So the last night of Ramadan is... Uh, or the last night before Eid, is when Zakat al-Fitr becomes wajib. That's when it becomes wajib. Is that clear? It becomes wajib at that time. If somebody dies before that, there's no Zakat al-Fitr. Does that make sense? If they die before the night of Eid, there's no Zakat al-Fitr. Is that clear? If a baby is born after the night of Z Eid al-Fitr, there's no Zakat. If they're born on the 29th day of Ramadan, there's Zakat al-Fitr. Does that make sense? So if they're alive, during that sun, the the the... the the, 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 what does he say? The sunset of the last, you know, the, the day of Eid, the, that night of, that's of Eid, then the castle of Fitr is wajib, even if it's a newborn born that hour. Make sense? All right. And then he says, the, the zakat of Eid al Fitr consists of 2.036 grams, kilograms of the main staple of the area in which it is given, of the kinds of crops on which the zakat is payable. So you pay, zakah originally was paid in, in food. That was the majority of our scholars. They say zakah, al-fitr has to be paid in food. You must distribute food to the poor. 
that food is what? 2.036 kilograms of gold, which is roughly a little, thing, a little about less than four pounds, I believe. About four pounds of, of that food. Huh? More than, four More than four pounds? Okay. So roughly that amount. Yeah. So it's very, it's not that expensive. You know, you can take, today in the U.S., I would say the staple food is probably, uh, you know, uh, wheat, flour, right? That's kind of like the, the one staple food. People eat flour, baked food more than they eat rice, right. right? Maybe in other parts of the world, they eat rice more than, right, flour. than flour. But in the U.S., it's pretty much flour. So you can say flour, wheat. You take that, five pounds, you give it. You give that of in Zakat al-Fitr, or 2.036 kilograms of it. That's the Zakat al-Fitr. Yeah, uh huh? Not rice, because some people are allergic to flour. It could be rice, but the, the U.S., that's the main staple. Um, if the main staple is bread, only wheat may be given. See, so if bread, and I, well, from what I see, at least, is that bread is the main staple of the of the U.S. Right? They rely on bread. Breakfast, you have sandwiches. Yeah. Lunch, you're having a burger. Right? Pizza, you have flour as well. Yeah. Right? Dinner is another sandwich, another bread. So we rely a lot on what bread. Right. Bread is, is, bread is, 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 is easy and affordable, and it's satisfying. It fills you. It used to be considered the food of the poor because of, you know, how it's filling and affordable, right? Um, so bread has become like the staple food in the U.S., I would say. In other parts, right, of the world, we can probably say the majority of the world, it's, it's rice. It's not, it's not bread, right? But in Western countries, we rely heavily on bread. So you pay that wheat value. Now, the, the contemporary scholars have predominantly, I don't want to say predominantly, but a significant amount of our scholars have went to the opinion of the Hanafi school, which is that you can give the cattle fitter in cash, in cash value. So that's why they collect the cattle fitter and most massage it in cash, and they distribute in cash. Classically, it was food. Classically, it was food. Right. It but makes sense? Before, Ramadan, even if you send back home, they and you, they have them send give food? Yeah. yeah. What I personally do is I pay it twice. I pay it here in cash, and I have my relatives uh, distribute it in food back home. So I, I do both. I distribute the food, and I distribute the cash. All right. And so... One is the first, the, the, the food is zakah. And I also make the intention of zakah with this one, zakah al-fitr, inshallah ta'ala, la bas. You can make two, two, two intentions. Is that, is, that, is that okay? Does that make sense? No. Uh, whichever one goes out first would be the zakah. And then the second one would be sadaqah. Whichever one goes out first. But inshallah, you do the intention. If one is invalid, then the other one is. So you're safe. According to all the ulama, your, your zakah is valid. You did the safe, did the safe thing. And then he says, it is permissible to give the zakah of fitr to deserving recipients any time during Ramadan. This is something that most people don't know. So you can give zakah al fitr according to the Shafi'i school any time during Ramadan. People, they wait till the last day, they pay, they pay their zakah al fitr late. Brother, give it five days, ten days, put it in the box, let it be taken care of. Don't wait. I remember last Ramadan, People were still bringing me the cattle fitter a day after Eid. And I'm like, yeah, nice. You have to pay on time. You know? So I encourage people to pay at least a week early, a couple weeks. is okay. Put it in and it takes some time for it to get distributed. But don't delay it and end up paying it late. Uh, and then he says, um, though the best time is on the day of Eid al-Fitr before the Salah. The best time to give your zakah is the day of Eid, before Salah. That's the best time. And that's what we try to do. When we take the zakah at the masjid last year, we, try, we distribute it to the, to the poor before Eid Salah. Right? And so that's what we try to do, inshallah ta'ala. Um, and so here in the West, organizations usually distribute it. Right? Other abro abroad, you might know people. Alhamdulillah, you know, in, in, in the U.S., we have great welfare system and social services and, you know, things. Alhamdulillah, people are... Uh, sometimes it's hard to find people who need it. So oftentimes, we, you know, you can send it to, you know, places that are afflicted, relatives who, are, who might need it, who are qualified, 
Um, uh, you can send it to war-torn countries, Syria, Yemen, other places. So, to, inshallah ta'ala, to, and, and that qualifies. He said, it is not permissible to delay giving it until after the day of Eid. You can't delay it beyond the day of Eid. It is a sin. That is, one may give it until sunset, and it is a sin to delay until after this, and one must make it up. If you miss it, you have to make it up. You can't just say, okay, khalas, it's done, I forgot. You have to make it up. You, you just pay it. You just pay it. It's the same amount, you pay it. That's all. You just pay it. That's all. And then the last category of this chapter, he says, Rahimahullah, the, uh, the commentator is, is actually speaking. Uh, there are eight categories of recipients. There are eight people that can be given zakah. There's eight categories. And this is in Surah At-Tawbah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم إنما الصدقات للفقراء والمساكين والمهاجرين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان إنما الصدقات إنما الصدقات للفقراء والمساكين والعاملين سبحان الله يفرق والعاملين والمؤلفة نعم المهاجرين والعاملين عليها والمؤلفة قلوبهم وفي الرقاب والغارمين وفي سبيل الله وبن السبيل so eight categories is in Surah At-Tawbah uh, so what are they? The first people is the fuqara. The fuqara are considered destitute. Faqir, some people they ask, what's the difference between someone faqir and someone miskin? What is the difference between faqir and miskin? Right? So here he translates faqir as destitute. Someone who does not have wealth or earning that is sufficient for himself. Is that clear? They don't have wealth. They don't have earning to take care of themselves. That's faqir. Miskin is a little better than faqir. He's poor. Someone who has something to spend for his need, but it is not sufficient. So miskin, he has some income. He has some money. But he is not enough to pay all of his bills. Is that clear? So somebody that has a job can still be miskin. Make sense? Somebody that has a job can still be miskin. It doesn't mean... If, they're not, if they can't afford all their bills, and they're struggling and they're falling behind on, exp on, on payments and can't buy the gro all the groceries they need, they're miskin. You can give them zakah. You can give them zakah. Even if they have a job. Even if they get social welfare and so on. Even about they, they pray on and off, still give them? Right? Yeah, yeah, they're Muslims. Okay, even Muslim, if they pray. Just give them. Any Muslim you give. Okay, okay. So and they don't have to be like a don't, Muslim. No, no, no. Don't investigate them. That's not, your, that's not our job. A Muslim, we know them to be Muslim. Bismillah, tafadla. That's it. Yeah, we don't have to investigate them. Um, yeah, as long as you know they're qualified, they're close. Especially, it's good to give folk with the people in the area of your community, right? The Hadith, as the Prophet ﷺ said, "To akhdu min aghniyaim, faturadu ala fuqaraihim." It is taken from the rich of the community and given to the poor of the community. So the best is to give to your local community. But also we have to consider emergency. If there's a natural disaster or something or a war and there's a calamity in a certain region. So then in that case, it's, it's okay to prefer them in certain special circumstances. How about a family back home? They're closer than... Yeah, and if you have family, relatives, it's okay. You have, yeah? yeah. If you have, so you can give zakat to your parents, your children, and descendants or ancestors. But you can give zakat to your uh, auntie, uncle, mother brother, mother. Uh, your wife can't give zakat to her mom. But, but you can give. Yeah. Can you give zakat to your mother-in-law? That's actually, because you're not obligated. But I would assume you can, but I would want to check the aqwal of the fuqaha. Because the scholars, they say, you don't give zakat. لِمَنْ وَجَبَ عَلَيْكَ نَفَقَتُهُ You don't give zakat to the people you are obligated to spend on. Who are the people you're obligated to spend on? Is your parents and grandparents and ascending. Your children and grandchildren and descending. And your spouse. Those are the people you're obligated to care for. So those people, you cannot give them zakah ever. But your brother... Your cousin, your uncle, your auntie, your nephew, your niece, your relatives. It is actually best to give it to them because you get the ajr of silatu rahim and the ajr of zakah. So you fulfill two wajib with one amal. 
So it is better to give it to him, to them. And this is balanced. Because you also have to look at the need of the local people. And you also have to look at the need if there's calamities in parts of the Muslim world. You have to consider that as well. Right? So, inshallah, see where is the greatest need and give it there. See where is the greatest need and give it there. And diversify your zakah as well. Don't put all your zakah in one pool. What about to give him zakah for his stepdaughter? It's okay. Yeah. yeah. Remember, only your parents and ascending, children and descending, and spouse. Siblings is okay. Your siblings, maybe you have a brother, he's a student. Yeah. He's going to school, doesn't have income, right? Very little. You help him with some of his uh, uh, living costs, it's okay, it's okay. So calamity considered needy? Yeah, of course. Right. I mean, yeah, because if, if they lose their house, they don't have a way to work, they, there's no, I mean, yeah. yeah. They don't have enough to take care of themselves. Because that's what the definition of miskin. Miskin is someone who has some money to spend, but not enough for all of their needs. They have some money. Maybe they have a car, maybe they have a job. But they still cannot meet all their needs. Fakir has nothing. So miskin is second. Remember Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam when he, when he created a hole in the ship, right? Mm-hmm. What did Allah say? فَكَانَتْ لِمَسَاكِينَ يَعْمَلُونَ فِي الْبَحْرِ The ship belonged to masakin. They were fishermen. They had a job. They had a boat. But Allah still says, they're what? Masakin. So masakin are people. They work, but it doesn't have, they can't meet all their needs. So they're still miskin. So you have a relative that still, he works, or, but they don't have enough for all their expenses and their needs. And we're not talking luxury and comfort, but we're talking the general necessities and needs. Then it's okay, they're miskin, you can give them zakah. And again, it's always best to diversify. The Shafi'iyah actually say it's wajib to diversify. You know the categories of the zakah? They say you have to give a percentage to faqir, a percentage to masakin. The third are the amilina alayha, the people that collect zakah. They get a percentage so they can keep doing their job. Wal-mu'allafati qulubum are those whose hearts are to be reconciled. These people, there's a lot of debate. Do they still exist? Those people who became Muslim or we, and they're, they're still new to Islam, can we give them zakah to soften their hearts? A lot of the scholars, they say no. That was only in the beginning of Islam for certain reasons, and it doesn't apply. Others said it can still apply. I'm not going to talk about that for the sake of time, but that's a discussion, and if you want to give that zakat to that group, let me know, inshallah, and we can discuss it. If you owe debt, if it's short-term debt and long-term debt, there's some detail. We, we don't have the time right now. Is, inshallah, maybe we can. I can talk. We have. Can, I, I need. I have four masail. We have to talk about debt. We have to talk about 401k and um, and rental property and investment. We have to talk about jewelry, jewelry uh, other than gold and silver, and, and some of the ahkam of Jum'ah. Inshallah, I, I don't have my pencil. If somebody can take a note of that and <laughs> remind me, otherwise I'm going to refer to the recording. I'm going to listen to the recording, and and listen to it. Inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. We'll bring those masail up tomorrow, inshallah. Ta'ala. I'll try my best to do the research before the dar so that we have some answers, inshallah. Uh, and then the, quickly, the, the last category is riqab, our slaves. Slave has been, slavery has been abrogated, so we don't have to deal with that right now. Those in debt, and so those who are in debt and are unable to pay off their debt, um, they, can, they can also uh, uh, be given zakah. Still the loan. Huh? Still the loan. That's long-term debt. This is like more immediate debt, and, and, and they can't pay it off, and, and they're struggling to keep up with their expenses and debt. But if they're actually like, student loan is like, you plan for it. You're like, oh, I have my income, and then I'm going to keep paying. Mortgage, you plan for it, right? That's different. This is like short-term debt that you, you, that's putting a lot of pressure on you. The, the lender is telling you, where's my money, where's my money? You're trying to pay your bills and you can't keep up. That person that avoids you every time they see you because they owe you money but they can't pay you, right? Those, those people, they're, they're, they're in debt. They're in, they're in pressure, short-term debt, right? The number seven, Sabilullah, 
uh, sabilillah. So this is the in jihad, and others have said even students of knowledge, and this is valid. And this is something we got to talk about in the future, is the importance of establishing foundations uh, for a, a scholarship for Islamic knowledge. Because that is the only way we're going to keep producing scholars in our communities. Every community has to have a foundation dedicated to uh, sponsoring the brightest of their community members to seek sacred knowledge. If we don't have ulama in our community, we lose our community. And we need ulama from this community, this land that are born and raised here. Because somebody from back home, as much, they can be the greatest scholar in the world, they're not going to be effective. They're not going to be effective. That's why the MBA, they were always sent from their nation, their community. They come from them and they're sent to them. They don't go to another town. They don't go to the next land. They stay in the land that they're, they're from and they give da'wah to them. That was the way of the MBA. And so us as Muslims in the West, we have to wake up and we have to establish foundations to sponsor. And we want our best kids. You know, parents, we, we oftentimes like money, 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 go become a doctor, go become a surgeon, go. Who, who's going to say, I want you to lift the community up? I want my son, my daughter to be a scholar, not to make money, but to make people succeed in their deen and dunya. Right? That takes, that takes sacrifice. Because most of us, we just want our kids to have financial security. Right? But we're not thinking, how can I use my kid to help other people and save other people? and guide other people. So this is something as a community, we have to get out of that mindset where we're just like focused on financial security. It's important. If all of our geniuses and all of our smart youth always just worry about money, then who's gonna teach the deen? Who's gonna, who's gonna be there to, to provide the education to the rest of us that need to learn, right? So this is a calamity, a dilemma that we have, that as a community, inshallah, hopefully our masjid as we progress, inshallah, and we grow, we can hopefully establish a foundation where we start sponsoring students to seek sacred knowledge. Every few years, if we can send one or two, it's a big blessing. You know, and over, over time, we'll produce scholars that can give back to the ummah, inshallah. And then the last one, for the sake of time. I just wanted to speak on this because it's very important. It's a project that I hope to pursue in the future and that we should all think about, inshallah ta'ala. And then the last one is Ibn Sabil. And this is a traveler in need of money. And, and this doesn't really exist today. Um, you might find rare circumstances. Before, traveling was different because um, there were no hotels, no transit, no pit stops. You're on a camel, a horse for days, weeks, right? And you run out of food. You might get robbed, right? Highway robbers. And you come to a town, you have nothing. So part of the care has to be for these people. Okay, they have nothing. They're, they're, they've been traveling for a long time. Assist them. But today, alhamdulillah, you have hope. Before, when the, when the musafir comes, you have to host him for a few days. Today, that doesn't really apply because there's a hotel. It's easy. Bismillah, brother. Don't move up. Burden on other people. There's, it's easy. So the, 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 the world has changed significantly. But traditionally, the care went to those travelers. If they came and they were in need, there would be some funds allocated to care for them. And that's the end of our chapter for tonight on zakah. Tomorrow night we'll address some of these um, sa'il, inshallah, questions. Briefly, inshallah. And then we'll start Kitab al-Sawm, bi'ithnillah uh, ta'ala. Uh, inshallah, tonight is the night of Jum'ah. So again, we remind ourselves to read Surah Al-Kahf, uh, to make salawat, inshallah, and dua. Friday, Jum'ah, three, dua, three ibadah. Outside of Jum'ah. Surah Al-Kahf, abundant salawat upon the Prophet Sallallahu and dua, a lot of dua. That's, that's, that's the ibadah of Jum'ah. That's how you should spend your day. And so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins. And we ask Allah to increase us in knowledge. And we ask Him subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us understanding of this deen. We ask Him subhanahu on this blessed night to accept our duas and to forgive our sins and remove our hardships. And we ask Him to grant us istiqama upon this deen until the day we die to guide us and our, our spouses, our children, and all of the Muslimin, to forgive us, our parents, our teachers, and all of the Muslimin, those who are alive and those who have passed. Allahumma ameen wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.